I would increase my allocation to cash. Um, I'll stick with cash, but let me kind of put that in a context. The most powerful investment tool we have is diversification. Problem is people don't understand what diversification means. So I run into people all the time. They say, well, I'm completely diversified. I own 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, you know, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, minerals, you know, et cetera. And I say, you're not diversified. You may own 50 stocks in 10 sectors, but you have one asset class, stocks, which are subject to conditional correlation. They, in calm markets, yeah, they, they're idiosyncratic, but in panics, they all go down together or in bubbles, they all go up together. So they're, so you're not diversified. So what is diversification? Diversification is having slices of asset classes that are minimally correlated. There's no, probably not zero, but as close to zero as you can get. So what would that be? You'd have a slice of gold, but I recommend 10%. And people, I have some strong views on gold and I've written a lot about it, but people are surprised to hear me say 10%. Like, oh, Jim, why isn't it 50% or 100% if you believe all this? Well, I do believe it. I wouldn't say it if I didn't, but you don't want to be 100% in anything. You don't want to be 50% in anything. 10% is fine. If I'm wrong, you won't get hurt. And if I'm right, you're going to make so much money that it'll actually kind of be the insurance on the rest of your portfolio. But that leaves 90%. So I would have a large slug in cash, maybe 30%. And people say, well, wait a second, banks pay me 25 basis points, you know, stock market's going up. Why would I want to be in cash? That's horrible. A couple of things. Number one, the stock market might not always go up. Cash is the opposite of leverage. So leverage increases the volatility of the rest of the portfolio. You'll get much bigger returns, but mm -hmm. you'll have much bigger losses. If you have a slice of cash and you say you've got uh, a volatile asset over here, which are stocks and other volatile assets over here, gold's fairly volatile. If you got that volatility and you have cash, it will reduce the overall volatility so you can sleep better at night. Cash is a great asset in deflation. And if you're talking about inflation, which is here, then you gotta, you gotta deal with that. But uh, don't rule out deflation. If we go into a recession because the Fed over tightens or, you know, the thing about the, the inflation, just a quick side, there, it comes in two flavors. There's cost push and demand pull. Demand pull is when individuals are, are worried about inflation and they start accelerating purchases. Like, hey, I better go buy that washing machine right now because the price is going up. Or better go buy that house right now because the price is going up. That's demand pull. Cost push, uh, cost push. Uh, push comes from the supply side, not the demand side. And that's what we're seeing uh, mm -hmm. because of what we talked about, supply chain, energy cost. The Fed can't drill for oil. You know, raising interest rates doesn't get you more oil or natural gas. So the Fed can't do anything about it except kill the economy. Yeah, and that'll cool it off. But when you pay, uh, you know, I, I put gas in my car. I don't just read about this stuff. You know, it used to be $45, now it's about $75. Multiply that by 200 million cars uh, across America. What happens is it reduces your discretionary income. If you're paying another 30 bucks at the pump twice a week, then you're not gonna go out to dinner Friday night. You're not gonna, you know, take a, a vacation, whatever it may be. So that depresses all those other areas. So there is this recursive function. So don't rule out deflation down the road, not right away, but you know, maybe next year. So cash, but here's the, here's the biggest value of cash. It gives you optionality. People don't understand this. Uh, what if I said to you, "Hey, I'll sell you, I'll sell you a call option, an at the mar at the market call option on every asset class in the world?" You go, "Yeah, that sounds kind of valuable." You know, well, that's what cash is. You, you know, when things are crashing, you're the one who can go shopping. And nobody's better at this than Warren Buffett. He's got his cash level at Berkshire Hathaway is at an all-time high. So there's a place for that. You can have some stocks, but I would look at the energy sector. I mean, this. Um, I actually built and I own the largest non-commercial solar module field in New England. And I run my house off it. It's, uh, it produces about 7.5 um, kilowatt hours. Uh, so I know a little bit about it. And uh, what I know is it doesn't work at night. It doesn't work in snow. It doesn't work in rain. It doesn't work in really cloudy days. By the way, you don't run your house off of solar modules. You run your house off of batteries. Yeah. And then mm. the modules charge the battery. So you watch the battery level. That's how you manage it. So it works fine. But if you think you can run cities with that, forget it. So it's just not practical uh, at that scale, even if you thought it was. And it isn't. That's that's very clear. But here comes, uh, you know, wind turbines and um, solar. And I'm not against it. Like you say, I own one. But uh, but they're not scalable. They're intermittent. You can, And they don't give you the base power, uh, the baseline power you need to run a modern power grid. Meanwhile, here's global demand, okay? So the gap, the gap's getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. Renewables, whatever the pros and cons, 
are not closing the gap. The gap's getting bigger. There is no substitute for oil and natural gas and, and uranium. You got to you got to put uranium in the mix and you know, hydro. If you live in Quebec, that's great. A lot of hydro, but it, not so much in the desert. And I've spoken to you know, without mentioning names, I would say you can go no higher in terms of who knows. You know, let's just say board members of the five biggest oil companies in the world who who said. Yeah, as he said, we talk about that, but we, we can't say it publicly because we'll be, you know, uh, dragged, you know, chained and dragged to the to, through the streets. But that's just those are just the facts. So therefore, if you have an oil sector that's been bashed by the climate alarmists, and but you can't do it without it, which is true, buy some oil companies. You know, when, when they're you know, so there's your stock portfolio, private equity, venture, real estate, uh, not commercial but residential, yes, and you know, farmland. That's one of the hottest assets categories and uh, and gold. So that's diversification. And that's the kind of portfolio you want, the kind of season to taste. So the question is, will the Fed go down that path, do what they have to do, do the only thing they can do uh, to subdue inflation at the cost of a very severe recession and something like a stock market crash? Or Will they see that coming? They'll be the last to know. We'll, we'll all see it <laughs> before they do, but uh, they'll, they'll be the last to know. It's because they rely on flood, flood models and they're kind of in their own economic forecasting bubble and they're very defective ways of thinking about the economy and they're very much a creature of inertia. There are a whole lot of reasons why the Fed is not nimble. It's kind of quite the opposite, but they'll see it eventually, probably when it's too late. And Will they balk at that point and stop rate hikes and maybe even reduce rates? That could save us from the recession, but that will just amplify the inflation. So mm-hmm. rather than say which one's going to happen, I, I prefer to lay out those two paths and then just watch it very carefully. But more to the point, we've seen this movie before. This is a replay, and I, I think it's on, um, you, know, d- you know, like you hit the remote control for double or triple speed. It's going to happen faster. But this is a replay of everything that happened from 2013 to 2019 and, and into 2020, which was, so I'll just go through it quickly. So 2013, May, Bernanke says we're going to taper asset purchases. That's that's money printing, quantitative easing, whatever you want to call it. The market, you know, tanks, bonds go down. Everyone's like, oh, it's over. Bernanke blocked. But finally, in November 2013, they said, okay, the taper begins. They were still printing money, but at a slower rate, and that matters. That went on until late 2014. The taper was over. They stopped buying new assets. They said, okay, here come the interest rate hikes. Except they didn't come for another year. It wasn't until December 2015 that then Janet Yellen finally raised rates. And then another year for the second rate increase, it was December 2016. So it was really, really slow. Took two and a half years. But they got to two rate hikes. But then here comes Jay Powell. And then like clobber, boom, 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 25 basis point hikes every meeting. And all the Fed was trying to do was was to get back to normal. They were trying to get interest rates to maybe two and a quarter, two and a half, get the balance sheet down to, you know, something like 2.5 trillion. They never specified it, but that would have been a reasonable level. So, okay, now interest rates are kind of normal, two and a half, balance sheets down around two and a half trillion. We're back to normal. We finally got through the, the global financial crisis of 2008. We kind of, we undid all that stuff. Well, what happened? Um, from October 1st, 2018 to December 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 20%. That was the, the, the December 24th, 2018, we call it the, the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock market went down 3% in one day. But the Fed uh, was tightening into the weakness, as they always do. And the last interest rate hike, it was uh, December 16th or 17th, they, within a day or two, but mid-December 2018, they were still hiking and raising rates. And that was the last straw. And then the market just tanked. And then finally, Jay Powell got the message uh, first week of January, 2019. He says, okay, that's it. We're going to be patient. Use the word patient. It's one of these code words. You have to get the code book out and see what it means. But patient means we won't raise rates again without giving you advanced warnings so you can get out of your carry trades or whatever. Uh, And then he went further, said, huh, looks like we got to cut rates. And they did. And then by early 2020, here comes the pandemic. And then they took rates all the way back to zero. And then they started QE, I don't know, six, seven, call what you want. They took the balance sheet to seven and a half trillion dollars after getting it down to three and a half trillion. So look at that whole sequence from 2013 to early 2020, including the pandemic. What happened? They tapered the asset purchases. They raised rates. They sank the stock market. Then they said, okay, no more rate hikes. Then they cut rates and then they started QE. And by, by April 2020, where were we? 
zero rates, back down to zero, and the balance sheet was a seven and a half trillion after getting down to about uh, three, three and a half trillion. So that was a big um, a circle. They ended up back where they started from. But the point being, they failed to normalize. They failed to get rates where they wanted. They failed to get the balance sheet where they wanted. They did sink the stock market. Okay, now two years forward, here we are again. What are we doing? They just raised rates at the at the March meeting. They're going to raise them again in May. And that's the easiest forecast I've ever made. 50 basis points, May 4th. Boom. You can, you know, you can count on it. And they're going to announce, uh, by the way, I don't have a crystal ball. The Fed told us this. I mean, that's the thing about the Fed. They may be wrong, but they're transparently wrong. So they tell you what mistakes they're going to make in advance. So that's the Fed forecasting is actually fairly straightforward because you just have to believe them. Uh, so uh, so they're going to raise rates again in May, probably 50 basis points. They're going to announce a reduction in the balance sheet, whether they actually start it in May. They probably will. $100 billion a month reduction in asset purchases. So that's QT, quantitative tightening. In other words, they're running the same playbook they tried to run or they started to run in 2013, 2014. They failed the last time. Why do they think they're going to be any more successful this time? Why do they think they can get out of this? And the answer is, <coughs> pardon me, the answer is they cannot without a recession. They can normalize rates in the balance sheet and they can stop inflation, but not without causing recession and not without causing a stock market crash. So the big question for the next year is, will the Fed do that? And they may. Or will they balk again, at which point you might rescue the market, but the inflation is just going to go wild that's that's the debate but 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 the thing is about framing it that way you've got two paths and we'll get, we'll get signals along the way we won't we won't be the last to know the fed will but we won't you'll be able to see this coming